Hey folks, it's Levi. Welcome back to The Buffet. Today I'll be doing a retrospective look at one of PlayStation's most beloved titles, nearly a decade after its release. That's right, I'm talking about Bloodborne. After the explosive success of From Software's most recent title, Elden Ring, in 2022, and a resurgence in popularity due to its DLC release of Shadow of the Air Tree, the world is once again anticipating what From Software has to offer next. While Armored Core 6 was a success, it did not land as the cultural zeitgeist that is Elden Ring. I spent a decent amount of time in the world of Elden Ring and its most recent DLC. With almost 200 hours under my belt, I can attest that Elden Ring truly is one of the greatest games of all time. So you can understand my post-completion depression when I finally beat the DLC's final boss and was left wondering, what next? And with that thought, it became clear I still needed to fill the void left behind from Elden Ring. Once you've risen to the challenge that From Software provides, there are little options left that can match. So I finally bit the bullet, pun intended, and dove headfirst into Bloodborne. This is my retrospective look at Bloodborne, a decade in the making. Bloodborne was released back in 2016 and is exclusive to the PS4, much to the chagrin of Souls fans on Xbox and PC. To date, Bloodborne and Demon's Souls are not available on PC, so if you have a PS4 or a PS5, consider yourself lucky to have access to this gem. As this is my first time experiencing Bloodborne, I was worried the transition was going to be a struggle. Elden Ring being open world, if a boss is difficult or overpowered, you can just go out and level up. With Bloodborne, the path to victory is very linear. There are optional bosses along the way, but few and far between. There is the ability to grind out Blood Souls, but it's far more tedious, as you'll be expected to run through a limited number of areas for those sweet, sweet souls. And that becomes rather tiresome pretty quickly. Bloodborne wants you to progress in a generally consistent manner, so most of the challenge is balanced. I never felt at any point like I wasn't really up to the task of fighting the next major boss or optional side boss. And with that said, I don't know if it's Elden Ring's difficulty that pre prepared me, but I have to say, Bloodborne feels like an easier experience. By the time I was midway through the game, I was finding no struggle with any boss. Now you can summon companions to assist in battle, which of course I did. And I know some purists will mutter that I'm cheating or playing wrong, but to them I say, it's in the game. I'm gonna use it. I'm here to have fun. Speaking of bosses, let's talk combat. While it feels very much like other Souls games, Bloodborne has one distinct difference that sets it apart from its predecessors. There is no parry mechanic. Instead, you have a secondary weapon that acts as a stun. With perfect timing, you can stun enemies and bosses, leaving them vulnerable to close in for a massive damage attack. This is the core mechanic of the game, and once I understood this concept, the game's challenge became unique in its own way, separate from Elden Ring or Dark Souls. Now, perhaps it's due to my playstyle in Elden Ring, but I never parried in that game. My dual-wielding dexterity build did not allow me to parry, so I learned to do every encounter with dodges. This clearly helped me transition to Bloodborne because dodging is your friend. Even late into the game, I found I relied far more on a well-timed dodge than a stun from my pistol. There are various types of guns, torches, and magic items that take up your stun slot, but I generally stuck to the pistol. The pistol has a shorter window to stun, but forces you to really master the concept. The weapon choices are also much more limited. Each major weapon does have two modes, a short range quick attack, and then at the press of a button, your weapon switches to its secondary mode, giving more range, but at the cost of speed, a classic risk reward scenario. I found myself using the shorter variant for quick slashes and dodging my way back to safety. There are your typical weapons that you'd expect, axes, swords, broadswords, knives, and even some more strange weapons like a large studded wheel. Uh, all in all, the designs, while there are considerably less than Elden Ring, each feel unique and viable, able to carry you throughout the entire game. 
While the combat seems more focused to only a few playstyles, it still feels very tight and responsive. I've had a blast hacking and slashing my way through countless enemies. This is not to say there isn't challenge. As you progress, you will run into other hunters like yourself, who are not beasts or eldritch horrors, but prove to be even more lethal. The biggest challenges for me have come from fights with other hunters. Hunters have all the same tools you do. Think of it as a mirror match. They can stun and dodge just as fast. This makes these encounters thrilling and speedy and really give the feel of fights being more of a dance than a one-sided smash fest like with the usual rank and file enemies. All in all, the combat is tight, responsive, and the right level of challenge. When you die, and you will die, your death never feels unfair or undeserved. When I went down, it was my fault and I knew how to do better the next time. But Levi, what about the graphics? Does this game hold up almost a decade later? <laughs> Great question, viewer. The short answer is yes. This game still looks stunning. Everything from its color palette to the gothic building designs are all on point. The level of detail you can see walking through the blood-soaked streets of Yarnum, the damp, decrepit, haunted swamps, and of course the eldritch wastelands will leave you with a constant state of fear and unease. Of course, it does have its obvious technical issues you'd expect from a game that is nearly a decade old. Anti-aliasing on stairs is evident, and the draw distances of areas just over a ledge or below level can be rendered pretty low. However, these are expected for something that's from 2016, and I've ignored them entirely as the style carries this game and makes you feel like this world is lived in and horrific. A truly awful place for anyone to have to live in, which is what makes this game such great horror. The game runs at a solid 30 FPS, and even though I play most modern games at 60 and above, I actually didn't even notice the change, and became very used to it. I would love to experience this game at 60 FPS, but this is not a hindrance at all in terms of enjoying the game. The sound design may be one of the best aspects of Bloodborne. I had to stop playing this game on a headset as the surround sound was working too well. You can hear everything in this game. Every cobblestone step, every crunch of a blade of grass, water droplets dripping down the walls of the sewers, and it all adds up to a cacophony of sound that is both haunting and beautiful. You can hear the enemy's footsteps a floor above, the groans of an oversized brute lumbering nearby, even things that have no effect other than to make you uncomfortable, like the sound of a crazed woman laughing in an unsettling, psychotic manner. Later on, there's a constant crying of a newborn baby in the distance. As any parent would tell you, this one's the worst. Bravo to From Software and Sony for creating such immersive sound design. It's so good, like I said, I have to play the game without headphones because I become too freaked out. The music is epic, creepy, and beautiful. Everything you'd expect, from unnerving, slightly off-key violins, to booming boss fight orchestras with choirs singing your doom. I did notice that the game also just lets the sound be the driving force. Music is saved for fights and light atmosphere. It's the perfect balance of music and sound to create the perfect horror soundscape. The story of Bloodborne is much like other From Software games. Its deep, lore-heavy world-building carries the, at times, bare-bone plot that is unfolding in front of you. I will be honest, on my first playthrough, much like Elden Ring, I ended up having to watch other videos online detailing the intricacies of the overall plot. Even trying to describe the plot in this review would be disingenuous. There are major moments that wowed me and a twist in the world that has a very interesting impact on how the game can be perceived on a second playthrough. A very clever use of illusion is at play from the moment the game starts, and that twist was truly great to experience as a first time player. The overall concept is that the world is being ravaged by some sort of beast plague that essentially is turning the residents into beast men, werewolves, or worse. This event seems to happen yearly or every moon cycle, that I'm not too sure about to be honest. You awaken as a hunter, 
chosen to rid the world of these monsters and unravel the mystery as to why it's happening. That's about as much as I'm willing to divulge, as everyone should experience this game without things being spoiled. Bloodborne has been hailed as one of the greatest Souls-likes, as well as one of the greatest horror games to ever be made. And after my time in this horrible, terrifying world, I'm inclined to believe the hype. This game has created incredible, tight combat, haunting sound design, and world building that would please any Lovecraftian horror fanatic. I now understand why people have been asking for a sequel to this game, or at least a remake. With Dark Souls getting three games now, I have joined the fans who are asking, where's Bloodborne 2 from, Soft? The world deserves more, and I for one will now be asking this question for years to come. With all that said, if you were like me, or was sitting on the fence as to whether Bloodborne would be something you'd be interested in, I highly recommend you begin your journey right now, and don't miss playing this masterpiece. Bloodborne is currently available on PlayStation Plus, so I suggest you go download it immediately. Thanks for watching my retrospective review of Bloodborne in 2024. I hope you enjoyed the journey. If you did, don't forget to like the video, hit subscribe if you aren't already, and look forward to more reviews from me in the future. I'll see you on the next one.